Charlie Dimmock, Boys. the Rich Brothers, Jump. <laughs> and the Garden Rescue Team have a treat in store. Too much entertainment. They have come to the rescue of hundreds of British gardens. Now it's time to look back hey. and pick their favourites. This looks really cool. Oh, wow. 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 Look at that. <laughs> Fabulous. As they celebrate the very best. I don't like it. Huh? I love it. Oh. From extraordinary eco gardens. Thank you so much. <laughs> to exotic designs. Oh my gosh, no way. Gardens inspired by people. Is this the garden that you dreamed of? It is. Absolutely. <laughs> I think that's a thumbs up. And places. It's the most beautiful garden I've ever been in. Therapeutic spaces. Wow. And the most extraordinary transformations. Whoa. It is perfect. Yeah, come on. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, Welcome to, to Garden Rescue. Rescue. Top of the plots. <laughs> David, Harry, what are we chatting about today then? Well, today we're going to be chatting about inspiration and where we all get it from. Yeah, I find that quite difficult at times. I'm glad we've got the contributors that tell us what they want. Yeah, one of my favourite bits though is that inspiration behind the garden. More often than not, it has got a beautiful story, isn't it? And I do love, you know, the emotional attachment people have to, like, Nicole in Salford. Yeah. She remembers going to a Klein garden in Germany as a child, which is basically an allotment. Yeah. And she's got lots of happy memories. So I remember that garden. Yeah, similar to an allotment, but mm. with a teeny little difference. I feel like a Klein garden <laughs> comes hand in hand with an all sing and all dance and shed, yeah. doesn't it? <laughs> which you did, did so well. Ever so easy to build. <laughs> We love all our garden rescues, but this time we're looking at the transformations that draw inspiration from special memories. And our first for Nicole focuses on her happy recollections of her allotment, or Kleingarten, during her childhood in Germany. We spent a lot of our summers there and, you know, after school, and because we had a stove in there, it was really an all year round thing. These are some old photographs of uh, the Kleine Garden in Germany. And then everybody has one of these amazing sheds, not just tool sheds. They actually do enhance the look of the whole plot that you've got. It would be really lovely to have something that reminds me of those nice times that we had in Germany. Oh, baby, this is it, this is it. Here we go. Wow. <laughs> Charlie's incredible design for the Kleingarten was exactly what Nicole was dreaming of. OK, so we have a shed. Now, I know it looks like it's lawn, but it's got a green roof. So we have it as a little summer house. And then we've got a lean-to covered area, which has a pot-belly stove. The work of making Nicole's dream summer house falls to the landscaping team. So we just, we've got two sides in. In Germany, some Kleingarten sheds are plush enough to sleep in. Charlie's simple six foot by six foot structure wasn't that fancy, but getting the look and feel right was crucial. I mean, look at it, it's fantastic. And that includes installing double glazing in all six windows. Right. And a reinforced roof. <laughs> King of the world. <laughs> I'm loving this, Lee. It's getting there, isn't it? It is. So this is, we've got the uh, wainy edge, Douglas fir on this side. So is it a hardwood? No, softwood. It's a softwood, but you won't need to treat that really, will you? Uh, it lasts a long lasts time. Long time. Long yeah, it's been weathered that has yeah. for years. So. It looks really nice. The Rich Brothers get the job of building the porch. With foundations already dug, Harry pours in quick drying concrete to secure the posts. Yeah, very good, that. I'm surprised. Don't tell me it's there. There. Well, bottom of... Virtually bottom of the pit. There we are. So... Look at that, boys! It's plumb on the end as well. So... With the porch in place, Harry and David get to work on the shed's standout feature. 
and your list looks a bit bizarre, oh, doesn't it? Where's that going? In <laughs> on the roof. <laughs> and this garden was inspired by a German Kleingarten. And one thing Charlie really wanted to put into this garden was a living roof. And that's great because the Germans actually pioneered that and it's just going to look beautiful on top. But you do need to ensure that that structure of the roof is solid before you start adding on the materials for the living roof. And Charlie's gone for a high-tech approach so as not to overload it. Is it basically just trays to capture the moisture. So instead of having this huge tray which holds water and amounts to a lot of weight, you've just got these little cups that fill up and it means that this space here is nice and light and airy. I like your Dalek. Oh, I know, it's amazing, isn't it? It's so simple, but it's going to make a, a beautiful little feature up there. That roof is going to be the finishing touch yeah. to the shed. Oh. Oh, can't really call it a shed. I think we're going to have to name it. It's cabin? almost like a cabin. Or, or like an actual human a, name. A human name. Okay. It's like a ship, isn't it? Oh, so I have to crack a bottle of... Uh, Prosecco. Wine over <laughs> a Prosecco, because I'm just about to plant some grapevines. Oh! <laughs> right, let's get, let's get going. Lovely. I think we have to go, do you have to go the other way, H? Oh, no, it'll keep going, will it? Keep going back. How much further? Keep go on, you've got room. There we are, so this is the membrane going down, and this is just to protect the timber underneath. Nice waterproof membrane, and it prevents all this from rotting. While the brothers get busy lining the shed roof, Charlie's prettifying the patio. Now, this little area here is a real sun trap. The sun's starts off over there in the morning and goes all the way round and sets down over there. So this area here gets boiling hot. So a fantastic spot for some grape vines. So Vitis vinifera, this one's a, a black sort of fruit on it. But she's got weightier matters on her mind. I've got to think of a name for the shed. Everyone put your thinking caps on and think of a good name for the shed. Bernard? Bernard? It doesn't look like a Bernard. Why no. not? German name, surely. Oh, it does have to be a German name. A German yeah. name. Bertha? Uh, Heidi? It's a good name, though, Heidi. I like it. I bet you used to love that programme, didn't you? Dancing, <laughs> dancing through the meadows. <laughs> <laughs> Next up for Heidi Shed, the roof's Dalek like drainage matting, which the brothers are cutting to size. Strangely satisfied. The top of the shed is fully lined and ready for the layer of substrate, a lightweight growing medium which retains moisture and provides nutrients for the plants on a living roof. <laughs> yeah. It's finally time to put the green into the green roof. It's so dramatic, suddenly you've been able to roll out the whole mat of sedum. And this living roof is a real benefit to insects, to birds, and it also adds a lot of biodiversity to this garden. It's not just the wildlife that benefits. Green roofs can help cool the urban environment and improve air quality, as well as being very effective building insulation but also something beautiful for Nicole to look down upon from her bedroom window. For the last few finishing touches, Steve's adding the crossbeams to create the pergola, while Lee is attaching the tin roof to the porch and cutting a hole for the wood burner's stovepipe. With the stove installed, this garden is complete. Charlie has taken a little patch of Salford and given it a touch of Kleingarten grandeur with her five-star shed and the garden around it. But will it live up to Nicole's childhood memories? Would you like to open your eyes? Oh, my God. <laughs> wow! <laughs> I, <can't>, I, just... <laughs> I think that's a good sign, lost the words. just not my garden. <laughs> Oh, my goodness me. It's, it's just so sweet as well, isn't I it? I know, it's cute. Yeah. I love it. I really love it, it. Really, you just feel happy being in it. Yeah. This is definitely going to give the Kleine Gardens in Germany a run for the money. Oh, well, that's <laughs> nice <laughs> to know. Well, I thought Heidi the Shed looked 
very pretty with the sedum on her roof. Yeah, she did look fantastic. Not only does it look great, but actually that little bit of extra greenery will go a long way to helping purify the air in the garden. Yeah. Now I've got Ivy with me. Who have you got? Virginia. Oh, I'm surprised she likes the shorter man. I mean, she's pretty tall, isn't she? <laughs> So we've got Ivy and Virginia Creeper here because these guys are fantastic at helping to purify the air within your garden. Now, all the plants that you have in your garden are gonna help a little bit, but because these grow so large, just their pure volume is gonna help a lot more. Ladies' mantle is also great. It has quite hairy leaves, which helps to trap the particulates and helps to reduce nitrogen levels within the air. Now, the heady aromas of Provence provided the inspiration for our next couple, Gemma and Mike from Alton. Gemma and Mike spent their honeymoon in the south of France, falling so madly in love with the country that they were determined to bring Gallic vavavoom to their garden in Hampshire. I think we feel quite inspired by our trip to France and our honeymoon, and the idea of bringing some of that back to, back to our garden with lavenders would be really, really great. Hello. 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 Well, here we go. Wow. Charlie won with a plan that promised to bring the sights and smells of Provence right to their back door. I have dividing the garden sort of in half. This is a dry riverbed. Great. And I was thinking of using different varieties of lavenders so that the lavender will go on for much longer, but also mixing in lots of different plants that generally tend to be very pale, soft blues and purples that flop over the pathway. Central to Charlie's design is a dry riverbed, evocative of the south of France, complete with three bridges. But getting the groundwork done is crucial. The landscaping team start by digging up the garden and laying a layer of rocks and stones to represent the meandering stream before Andy gets on with one of the bridges. Charlie wants a little stepping stone bridge going through the stream, the dry riverbed. So I'm just going to get these big rocks, just playing around with them, really. Just positioning them in. Hopefully, we'll have a little stepping stone bridge later on. Meanwhile, another very heavy delivery has arrived. Coming through. A large slab of rock that will form the second of the bridges. No, go with it, go with it. <laughs> <laughs> Fingers. Lovely. Fantastic. Lovely. Look at that. It's gorgeous. And then over here we've got the wooden one. And this one is going to be quite a romantic, rustic timber bridge that we're going to cut up, create a lovely structure for it. Cool. OK. Bolt her in. Bolt her in. And now the bridges are all in place, Charlie can start to barrow in the plants. Woo -woo, woo -woo. It's a train coming down the train. Oh, look at this. Let's watch this. Oh, uh, uh, oh, oh not even a... didn't even budge. Look at that! You liking that? Nice I'm work. I'm liking it all. I'm loving all the different things. Yeah. <laughs> First plants, though, look yeah. at this. Nice. We like to see. I, I think this, this has got to literally just be the odd plant, as if... They've just sort of self-seeded. And I have to say, a lot of the plants that I've got here will. This grass, I actually love it that it's all bit bashed about and bent. It looks like a grass that's been growing and it's slightly distressed because the riverbed is dry. And then we've got, got a Rigeron Garvinsky anus, which is fantastic. And it really actually does better being distressed. Trying to grow it in a, a nice, rich compost, it doesn't really like it. The poorer the soil, the drier, the better and more compact it is. And it will just naturally self-seed around the rocks. Look at that. It's just two plants have transformed that bit of hard landscaping. The dry riverbed may be the centrepiece of their Provence-inspired garden, but Charlie's finding there's already plenty of Gallic touches in Gemma and Mike's garden. 
And the wonderful thing is, is Gemma's got some really lovely bits and bobs that sort of say French farmhouse, things like galvanised watering cans, there's a water bath over there. So by the time we finish the garden, it should look gorgeous, as long as the sun doesn't get to us first. Harry's turned his attention to planting up Provence-inspired pots for the patio, starting with the romantic job of drilling drainage holes. There we are. And in this first pot, I'm going to be planting it up with a little bit of thyme and some lavender. And as you can see, that combination is just gorgeous. And it really is very reminiscent of a Mediterranean scheme. They're very soft colours, but their aroma is going to be beautiful on this patio. So these two are going to go in here. And I've got some potting up compost, but I'm also going to put some of this stone in the bottom. And that's because lavender and thyme don't like really rich soil. They actually love a poor soil. And you can kind of tell because, you know, they're very Mediterranean plants, so in turn, that soil tends to be a lot drier and not as rich. A nice little mix-up. What I love about the thyme and the lavender is that as they grow, they're just going to kind of slightly cascade over the pot itself, so it's going to make it very kind of informal. And I think in a French garden, it's all about informality. So uh, I do love this, this combination. Evergreen, fragrant and loved by bees, lavender is the one plant that Provence is famous for, so Charlie is determined to go all out to recreate a South of France feel. Lavenders, they come in whites, they come in the, the traditional purpley blue, then you've got what we call the French lavender, which is much more flouncy, uh, and then I'm going to mix in some cat mint as well, because it's sort of that whole effect of tumbling over onto the pathway. And so when you brush by it, you get that waft of lavender scent. Charlie? Yeah? What's this one? Cat mint. The oh, Peter. It? It's lovely because it flops, but cats love it. It either makes the cats go bonkers and they run around the garden and have a frisky five minutes, or my cat, she literally rolls and lays it in it and goes, Ugh. So we're just going to wait five minutes and see what happens to Andy. <laughs> <laughs> As well as the cat mint and fragrant lavender, the beds are filled with beautiful roses. Et voila! The long, dull patch of grass has been transformed into a little piece of rural Provence. By Charlie's planting, her evocative dry riverbed and a handful of the garden's original Gallic touches. Do you want to open your eyes? <laughs> wow. <laughs> oh, my That's word. That's incredible. Oh, my. It looks like something that you see in a magazine. It's, it's perfect. And I can't wait to enjoy it. You don't have to transform your whole garden to create a feeling or a theme to it. By using plants, you can evoke lots of different images. I mean, lavender straight away, when you see it in bloom, just takes you straight to France and the countryside. And the great thing about a lot of plants, and especially lavender, is it's really easy to propagate and you get lots and lots of plants for free. Look for side shoots, not the ones that are flowering, but the side shoots, and you want to take the material First thing in the morning, when the plant's full of moisture, so I'm just going to take some big side branches off that I can take cuttings of, and these are going to be called semi-ripe cuttings. You can also do softwood, but these ones are going to be semi-ripe. Right, so when it comes to cuttings, basically any cuttings, you want to make sure that the compost that you're putting them into is quite free draining. So either add some grit, I'm using vermiculite, or you can use perlite. Just about 50-50, mix it together. I'm using a plastic pot because that holds on to a lot more moisture and you don't want your cuttings to dry out while they're trying to root. Firm it down slightly. Now, so choose nice healthy cutting material. 
and you want to strip the lower leaves. The cuttings need to be about three to four inches long, ideally. And in a pot, you're going to get about five or six cuttings in each pot. Make a hole and put that a couple of inches into the soil, firm it in. With semi-ripe cuttings, they'll take four to six weeks to root properly. Keep them watered well, but not sopping wet. And the, one of the best ways to do that, to stop them from drying out, is to put a cover on them. And let those drain well. So this keeps the moisture in. You want to check them weekly to make sure there's no dead bits of foliage on them and that they're still nice and moist. And you want to place them somewhere that's bright but not in full sun because otherwise it will cook the cuttings and you don't want that. And from this quiet little corner to somewhere very different, Richard and Darren from Solihull wanted to evoke that feeling of that city that never sleeps. Our next Top of the Plot's inspirational garden was for Richard and Darren, who tied the knot a couple of years ago in New York, and whilst on that romantic trip, took in the sights, one of which made a lasting impression. The High Line is a one and a half mile long public park, elevated above the streets on Manhattan's west side. It has a contemporary design with informal planting inspired by the self-seeded landscape that grew on the elevated train tracks during the 25 years it sat unused. What we really appreciated with the fact that it was the, with the abandoned kind of railway tracks and all the grasses were growing out of it, it was very kind of rural but also very beautifully maintained and it was just really, really attractive and quite quirky and that's something that we quite like to have. This is what I've done for you. Arit won the pitch with her take on New York's Highline vibe. This garden gives you a journey through space, taking you through planting. What I've done here is actually bring in some sleepers and some little girders. So again, they'll be planting within this. And if you remember when you walked along the High Line, you had those little pockets, didn't you, of planting that yeah. was within the railway track area. Arit's Big Apple can't possibly come to fruition without the hard work of the landscaping team, who get the ball rolling by removing turf, bricks and paving, before laying a brand new patio with a chic urban feel. I've chosen porcelain tiles in the garden for a number of reasons. First reason is it is incredibly hard wearing. And the other thing with porcelain is that you can get a whole different set of finishes on it. What I've done is to go for a wood finish. The high line was made of concrete slabs, but I wanted to give it a bit of a twist. Give it the same grey urban feel, but give it a uniqueness for Richard and Darren. And because New York's high line is built on an old train track, Arit wanted to bring a railway feel to the flower beds. In New York, what they've actually got is still got lots of the track left and they've planted into it, brought in all of these concrete pavers that go alongside it, and that's why we're emulating it here. I thought it's important to bring a bit of that track to Solly Hole. So here's the bed where they will be. It does need a little bit of work. We're going to get some of this soil moved off and put into the beds at the top there so I can get some more planting going on in that area. I've got Andy out the front, cutting the sleepers to size. You can get them laid out and start to intersperse the planting as if the sleepers have been here forever. Now, it's really important that if you are going to use sleepers in the garden that you do get them untreated. You don't want creosotes, bitumens, anything, any chemical to be leaching into the soil because it could actually damage the plants. What I love about these is that they've still got that gnarly effect on them, still got bolt holes that are coming in them, so they're very, very authentic. These were about £38 for a 2.6 metre length, so not the cheapest out there, but I thought it was worth getting quality for this garden. I want it to last and I want it to look authentic. Here they come. Just say about there. Yeah. It's not a literal 
rail track, OK? So I didn't want all the lines to be going totally parallel from the house because it's going to look a bit too staged. You've got to play around with it. So I'm playing with perspective. By the time the sleepers get sunk, it's going to feel more real. Get the plants in. So be playful. Once she's happy with the position, Arit can dig the sleepers into the soil so that they stay put. Voila. Can I have a bit of help? Oh, yeah. You saved me. Oh, I saved you. Kind oh, of. Cool. Well, I right, don't know, yeah. Can you grab that end? <laughs> yeah. Ready? Ready? Can you do that? Yeah. They're a bit heavy, aren't they? They are. Perfect. They're lovely, don't they? I oh, know, they're great, aren't they? They ain't cheap. No, I bet they're not. £500. Lovely. But you can't have a Highline uh, garden that one, can you? Highline garden, high prices. Yeah. Next one, please. Next one. Oh, I'm glad you had your breakfast today. Uh, <laughs> my love. That's Lovely. all I needed. Nice. Needed your, needed your brawn. Oh, yeah. Still got oh. some left from today. <laughs> I'll work out the rest. Yeah. Cheers. <laughs> to top off the New York theme, Arit drew inspiration from the city's most famous resident. Just doing a rough outline of the Statue of Liberty. If I were in New York, sat on top of a fabulous penthouse suite, I would see that iconic outline, and that's what I'm trying to create in the garden. So my idea is cut them out with a jigsaw and then get them attached to this piece of steel. Along with the world-famous statue, Arit cuts out silhouettes of the city's skyscrapers Ta -da! to create a New York skyline at the back of the garden. And with the final pieces falling into place... It's looking really good. Darren and Richard's backyard is transformed from a plain West Midlands garden to a vibrant Manhattan-inspired outdoor space with sleek modern paving and a planted-up railway track. One, two, three, go. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Wow, thank you so much. Oh, that's an absolute pleasure. The big question, mm. is this the garden that you dreamed of? I think it is. Absolutely. I think it is. Yes. There's, it's just, yeah, it's beautiful. And there's no lawn to mow, <laughs> so... <laughs> Arit's garden really captured scale of her inspiration in quite a modest sized garden in Solihull but if you don't actually have a garden and you live in the middle of the metropolis and maybe your only planting opportunities is a windowsill well then a small planting box is perfect for you and I'm going to show you a nice trick for packing in a lot of plants into a very small space so the plant I'm going to be using is sedums the reason we're using this is because they're shallow rooting and they don't mind being bunched really closely together. And that's why they're perfectly suited to being put into this small window box here. So these guys don't like sitting in moisture at all. They love free draining soil. So that's why it's important to put a really good layer of drainage stone in the bottom. That's a good layer. It's a really good idea to actually break up the soil either with some gardening grit or thermiculite. A load of funky shapes, some real zesty colours. Don't think I can go wrong. That little guy's a bit taller, so he can go at the back. He's gonna look pretty cool, I think, just hanging over the edge, by there. And what's so great about sedums is that once they've established, they require little to no watering at all. So it means you can look out your window and have a gorgeous display all year round. There we are. Fill in the gaps. People travel all over the world to look for inspiration for their gardens. And one of our favourites was with Andy and Danielle down in Devon because they wanted a little touch of Morocco. After a memorable break in North Africa, Andy and Danielle wanted to bring Marrakesh to their back garden. That sort of Moroccan style, the colour, the tiles, the glass, that's what we would love for the garden. You know, we've got a bit of a Moroccan influence inside the house as well. So if that could translate to the garden, it should all flow really nicely. The Rich Brothers' plan, mixing old and new to create the exotic feel the couple wanted, yeah. won out on the day. So what we've done is we've given you quite a modern design, somewhere with quite strong architectural lines, um, but overall with a kind of... Um, 
more of a feeling of a rustic Moroccan garden. Dreaming up a sunken patio in the couple's dilapidated garden may have helped the boys clinch the pitch. Yeah. But the landscape team have to put in hard graft of excavating the space before the Rich Brothers' Moroccan vision can be realised. It's nice not having a digger on site, isn't it? <laughs> yes. With the patio area dug out, foundations are laid and the walls are built and rendered. And then it's time for David and Harry to add the finishing rustic touch, Moroccan-style tiles. Now we finished scoring our level line all around the base of the wall. So that's where we know the top of the tile is going to meet to. But what we want to do, because there's a little bit of a gap, what we're making is this shelf at the bottom. So we're putting a shelf of cement there, and that means that the, the tile's going to have a little foot to rest on. So when we put it on the wall, it's not going to start to slide down and lose that nice, crisp top level. And it's literally a matter of starting in one corner and then just working our way around. With the Moroccan-themed tiles on the walls, it's time to bring in the feature tree for the new patio. Yeah, let's good. cut it, have a look at what it looks like, and then we'll position it. OK. We're going to position it right by here. So it's going to arch over that way, over this planting bed. This will be a lovely backdrop to it, but it's not going to impede on this area too much at all. So there'll be plenty of space here. The actual branches will be shifting away, so it won't be shading any of this out. For added rustic charm, the brothers include a low dry stone wall in their plans. And Joe gets the job of bringing it to life. Well, Joe, I've got to say, in my mind's eye, I was hoping for a wall exactly like that. Exactly that is like rustic, that. characterful, perfect. Brilliant. There you please, Harry. Yeah. <laughs> Every rock has its place, like people in life. Oh, <laughs> philosophical. Oh. <laughs> With the rendering nearly finished and the hole dug, the centrepiece can finally be put in place. I think we've dug, I think we've dug it all. Oh, there he is. Lovely. Eliagnus is a shrub more commonly known or more commonly used as a hedging shrub or as an evergreen filler shrub. But you can see, when it's left to grow a bit more naturally, it has this lovely open branching structure. Now, this one is Eliagnus umbellata. That's Japanese silverberry. It has lots of silvery interest. So, when the leaves first emerge, they're a silver, but they mature to this green. And then in spring, we have these kind of quite dusty, silvery yellow flowers, and they're scented. So within this space, when it warms up and they're sitting around it, it's really going to infuse the air, so that'd be really beautiful. Then later on in the season, it has an orange berry, and that's edible as well. And then, as it's deciduous, it has a tiny change of colour but drops its leaves. But this guy doesn't have much autumn colour. But that's not why he's here. He's here for his shape and also that silvery tone. So for all those reasons, it's the perfect shrub. And it does dominate the space, but that's perfect because it almost offers up different areas around the seating area that you can sit. So you've got that area there, much more open. But by opening up this area here, you've got this gorgeous place just to sit on the wall, underneath the dapple canopy, and maybe even read a book. And every plant has its role to play in the brothers' Moroccan-themed garden. And Harry set his heart on a bloom that's as popular in Morocco as it is in the UK. Roses are strongly associated with Morocco because they grow plenty of them for their rose oil. So we thought it'd be very fitting to put a couple into this garden. And the one that we've chosen is actually Francis E. Lester, which I've got here. And we've chosen this because it's a rambler. It's got this gorgeous kind of white, pink blush flower. And it's also got a beautiful scent and lovely small orange hips. And I'm going to position it behind this wall. And that's because I want it to kind of cascade over it, soften it, and it almost connects the wall with the planting behind. So it's a lovely trick. Although it doesn't look a lot now, in a couple of years, it's going to be beautiful and be a real showpiece. The bound gravel is added to the new seating area. The flower beds are filled up pots planted, and the garden dressed with Moorish touches. This Moroccan oasis is complete and ready for its grand unveiling. Andy and Danielle's garden was overgrown and unloved, with a poor excuse for a patio and little else. But now, with its exotic planting and simple architectural features, 
the team turned an unnoticed and unloved space into a beautiful oasis bursting with Moroccan charm. Open your eyes. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, wow. That was beautiful. Absolutely. I love it. Not too kitsch, though. It's not too, like, oh, this is what we're trying to do, Morocco. It's it's quite laid back. Oh, it's, nice. Yeah. Table works well. The Moroccan yeah. way, guys. Come yeah. on. <laughs> exactly. <you know? laughs> Now, I've taken inspiration for this pot from our Moroccan garden. Now, all I've done, the pot itself, when I bought it, was a basic terracotta pot with a blue glazed rim, which is very Moroccan, that vivid blue colour. And then I painted the side here with just an emulsion paint. You can buy the little tubs that are tester ones, a very cheap way of doing it. So nice and bright, and then I've just blinged it up a bit. <laughs> I'm sure the boys will think it's a bit over the top, but I love over the top. So that cord line's gonna go in there and got a fountain of foliage, lovely. Now, one of our best inspirational gardens was for Alex and Rachel, who wanted their garden to be inspired by the lost gardens of Heligan in Cornwall. Our final top of the plots was located just outside Nottingham, but the inspiration for this garden comes from 300 miles away in the West Country. So we went on a trip to Cornwall and we discovered the lost gardens of Heligan, which was pretty awesome. It would be nice to have that exotic feel, so if we could have some palms and... Some big dramatic plants. Yes. The couple weren't afraid to think big for the small plot. Alex. Hello. Rachel. Oh. Oh, wow. And Charlie's tropical take on the garden was music to their family's ears. You were after an uber-modern garden mm. with a jungle vibe. Mm. So tree ferns, fatsias, formiums, but with the odd shot of colour running through it. With Charlie's plan getting the thumbs up, the landscaping crew get cracking. Is it worth marking out where the lawn's going? So when the turf cutter comes, we can just... Nip it off. Yeah. They clear the turf. If in doubt, graph it out. <laughs> and lay a new patio by the house. First jungly plants coming through. And then it's Charlie's time to shine with her riot of tropical plants, including everything from banana to ferns and a set of elegant bamboo plants. Oh! So we're making a hedge of smaller bamboos here, but then I want that big black bamboo. I think will look great over there. So by just clearing the lower section of this bamboo, you suddenly make it look like you can see the canes really easily. And by exposing the cane to the light, they'll actually go darker and you'll get the blackness developing on them. While Charlie and the team soldier on with the planting, the jungle theme seems to send the Rich Brothers, well, a bit bonkers. It's not often that Welsh explorers get to move outside of their normal habitat, the Shire. But on this one instance, this explorer delves deep into the unknown jungle to find what they think is an extinct creature, known for its long dangly arms and flowing locks, often found eating a banana amongst the large foliage. Ah! And there it is. That idiot thinks I'm an animal. Charlie's putting in the legwork, and the planting areas are slowly taking shape. And now it's time to bring in the big boys. Oh, my! There's mine in the house. <laughs> yeah. Just a little bit. Where are these going, do you know? Yeah. So, so, the tree ferns there. The um, Phoenix Canarians is over there. Patsy are there. Oh. Uh, Cordyline's not sure yet, but definitely in here, probably. A formium. What do we think outside the back door there? There. Uh, Thank you. 
As the rest of the team get the plants into place, Harry's creating a miniature jungle pathway for Alex and Rachel's little boy. Me and Gruff actually making a boardwalk through this space. It's almost like a little balance beam for little Rex. It's lovely to have that sense of exploration and adventure in the garden, especially when there's a jungle theme. So we're going to put some posts in, put a little balancing beam in, and a nice little rope handrail. So it's going to be really exciting. Cheap and easy to make, the materials for the six-foot-long boardwalk cost about £30. It's looking really fun. I'm kind of jealous that Rex is going to get a chance to run on down there through the bamboo. But all I'm doing now is I'm putting in some rounded posts and we're going to put a little hole through there and put some rope through. So it's a nice little safety element to this, but also it's going to look really cool. With the large tropical plants in position, Charlie gets on with filling up the flower beds with jungle-inspired greenery. We've got several different bananas in the garden. This one is Abyssinian banana or Ethiopian banana. And I love it because of the, the sort of red rib of the leaf stem coming up round it. And I like the way the bananas have this big, fat base to them. They do look absolutely glorious. I have to say, I'm really pleased with all the different foliage effects that we've got going on. In most parts of the UK, banana plants like this will need to be wrapped up in fleece in autumn to protect them from frost. And that is not the only delicate plant going in. Charlie has also chosen the very banana-like canna lily. So it does look like a banana plant because the leaves mimic the banana leaves and that's why I chose them. But I love the contrast of the dark purple green against the light green of the bananas we've got there. In total, Charlie spent a cool £1,300 on plants. And as the last of the exotic plants go in, the garden is ready. This once boring patch of lawn has been transformed into a jungle paradise, inspired by Alex and Rachel's trip to the Lost Gardens of Heligan. Do you want to open your eyes? Uh, wow! <laughs> Houses! Oh my goodness! Amazing. Oh my! Oh my goodness! Oh my! Oh, it's amazing! <laughs> oh, I can't believe it, Charlie. Is there enough plants in here that you like? Don't cry, because so. you make me cry. It's, it's like a little jungle, isn't it? It's, like, incredible. He loves doing balance beams. Yeah? Yeah, he's... he's oh, it's like he's going to be lost in there, isn't he? Whoa. Charlie, a few tears there? No! Well, they were such a lovely couple, and the garden turned out well, I have to say. Yeah. Even yeah. with all your monkeying around. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, does, it goes to show that you can almost take inspiration from anywhere. And with a little bit of know-how, take that inspiration and not only make special gardens, but also very unique ones. Well, we do hope you've enjoyed looking back at some of our most inspirational gardens. See you again for some more Top of the Plots.